the Mohawk, Ganyagahaga. Tyndenaga Mohawk Territory, April 2008. It, it was always about the land, and it was stop the development of the land, and, and we did that. That it, sort of aggressive stance that was taken by police, that, in my view, was completely unjustified. Mohawk blockades and the police response. Ontario may have come within a hair's breadth of another Dudley George type of killing. Why is it important 10 years on to move this forward? It's because these issues have never been addressed. I want the story to be told so that people realize and people know when they go out and defend the land how, how they can protect themselves and expect what's going to happen. This is Tyndenaga Mohawk Territory in 2018. We just crossed into the border of Deserano. One side of the road is, is, is the town of Deserano, and one side of the road is reserve. Dan Doreen is a Mohawk land defender. Today, he's my tour guide. All of the important part of the town is on stolen land. Deseranto is a small town in southern Ontario. There's a creek right right here, and this is where the land claim goes to, right here. The Mohawks filed a land claim for around 900 acres called the Culbertson Tract, land taken unlawfully from the Mohawks in 1837. The federal government accepted the claim in 2003. The government actually uh, uh, said, yes, it's 100% Mohawk land, and no, you're never going to get it back. Canada's policy on specific land claims is to offer cash. But the Tyndenaga Mohawks have always wanted the land returned and development stopped. And we want them to revoke the quarry owner's license. In 2007, the Mohawks began a year-long occupation of a quarry. There's no authority under the Act for the minister to uh, withdraw the license. And the community said you can't very well be taking uh, uh, our land away truck by truck uh, from the quarry and be negotiating the land. Former Ontario Premier Mike Harris was grilled in February. Land disputes in Ontario and how they're policed had been under the microscope. Shot in 1995, Dudley George was shot and killed by a police sniper. The Ojibwe man was part of an occupation at Ipperwash Provincial Park. It seems so easy to take the land and just so difficult to give it back. The Ipperwash inquiry examined the actions of the Ontario government and provincial police, the OPP. We apologize for the events that led to the loss of life. The inquiry was still underway as another land dispute erupted in 2006. That development on our land at Caledonia must come to a stop. Well, Fantino phoned down and tell his officers there's one law for every person in this province, or is there two tier? The OPP was under immense pressure and public scrutiny. A caravan loaded with heavily armed reinforcements crept out of town. But the anger and resentment remains. Um, this is the first step of uh, an economic disruption campaign that will target the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipal government of Deserano. Back in Tyndenaga, the quarry battle continued amid political tensions. Blockades are not acceptable, they're not necessary because we are making progress at land claims tables. Jim and Prentice, after a while, because of the media coverage, um, just said that they would not negotiate a, a resolution to the claim in a, in a climate of hostility, and, uh, and then they pulled the plug on the, they shelved it. I'm not being critical of the protesters, you know, they have the right to protest if they want to. Uh, we were seeking for justice, we weren't out for bloodshed, and, and uh, we just simply, the, the, everybody wanted to see the claim resolved. Uh, to the satisfaction of the Mohawk people. In May 2007, the Ipperwash report was released. A hundred recommendations to avoid a repeat of the deadly violence. It would be put to the test a month later. Governments of all political stripes have demonstrated gross negligence. Increasing frustrations over the backlog of land claims led to a national day of action. It appears that the only avenue, the only recourse we have is to demonstrate, to protest. Come over here. 
Activist Sean Brandt was the public face of resistance for the Tyndanaga Mohawks. It's only been through these types of actions that First Nations issues have been made a, a priority. Brandt faced mischief charges and turned himself in. I'm obviously taking responsibility for uh, my actions on uh, June 29th. It would mean he couldn't be part of the coming protests, though Brandt would end up playing a key role. Relations between the OPP and the Mohawks were strained. It's been my experience, there's always a heightened threat perception by police the minute there is an Indigenous protest, particularly when the word Mohawk is, in, is, in, is used in the same sentence. Tyndanaga is home to Larry Hay, an investigator, a former RCMP officer. Hay was chief of the Tyndanaga Mohawk Police during the protests at the quarry in 2007, but then Hay talked about racism in policing during an interview. I, I made the comment to a student newspaper, a very obscure student newspaper, uh, and to one Aboriginal reporter, and that got blown way out of proportion. OPP Commissioner Julian Fantino fired Hay. He went ahead and uh, just revoked my uh, status as a police officer, and I've been uh, uh, persona non grata ever since, so I've, I've no longer police policeman. So Hay wasn't involved as events unfolded in 2008. But Hay has spent the last 10 years trying to find out what happened. And he's not alone. I've lost faith in some of the fundamental institutions in our society. Stan Jolly was a senior policy advisor for the Attorney General's office in Ontario, a career largely focused on Indigenous justice. In a sense, it's a, it's a challenge to my whole career. As a volunteer for Amnesty International, his research has uncovered hundreds of documents, including the OPP's own video of events never seen by the public before. I had no inkling that um, it was going to be this time-consuming and laborious a process. All the way through this research project, we've been trying to ask the question over and over again, raise the issue, why this um, threat perception? Um, it seems over the top, and it seems to be a complete um, uh, antithesis of what uh, Mr. Justice Sidney Linden recommended in the report on the Upper Wash Inquiry. Uh, so we set up in the park, we set a teepee up in the park and we had a gathering and a tobacco burning uh, here uh, the night before. It started on April 21st, 2008, when property owners Theo and Emil Nyberg announced a plan to build 200 housing units in Deseronto on 15 acres that's part of the land claim. So on the 21st, uh, we're into um, the park or, or uh, where, where some of the land claim is. And uh, it's where uh, Nyberg had uh, threatened to develop on the 21st. And where um, Nyberg, who uh, says he's the rightful owner, Mohawks say we're the rightful owner. The government says the Mohawks are the rightful owner. The Nybergs plan to bring a crew of 30 people to start clearing brush. The Mohawks planned to stop them. The Nyberg thing and the development thing could have been easily resolved. Keep his employees and keep Nyberg off the land until the land claim is settled. It's under negotiation. It seems to me like it's super easy. The Nybergs never did show, but the OPP were there in force, over 200 officers. Public order unit, canine unit, 
helicopter, the Tactical Rescue Unit, or True, commonly called the Sniper Squad. And a visibly frustrated Dan Doreen was front and center. When you turn to police officers to address a situation that is at most one of mischief, do you actually need to, to mobilize snipers for that? Craig Benjamin works for the human rights organization Amnesty International. From the very beginning, we think that the response to the land occupation and the protests around the, the culverts and tract in, in the Tainanaga Territory were vastly disproportional to, to any credible uh, you know, evidence uh, of any threat to, 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 to public safety. Do I really think that OPP are there for public safety? Absolutely not. This is the police. Anyone blocking the road is The OPP moved in and ended the blockades on the morning of April 22nd. The Mohawks left, but the OPP would maintain a heavy police presence in the following days. Coming up after the break. Hey, uh, Clint, oh. Slash Road's Tainaga Township. Slash Road's ours. Confrontation, arrests, echoes of Ipperwash. We had what we believe is a long gun pointed at us. At On the day Dan Doreen shows me the territory, look at an Ontario Provincial Police cruiser is sitting in the entrance to the quarry. Told you that was going to happen, didn't I? We turn around and go back. Still there? He is. Why do you think they were here? Uh, I believe someone called them. How are you? Good, you? Good. Help me with something? Uh, we're shooting a documentary. Oh, that's fine. Yep. Uh, thank you. This is the same road where Doreen was arrested 10 years ago. The Mohawk blockades ended on April 22nd, 2008, but the OPP stayed. And York and 49 are the only roads that you guys are permitted to be on. Post from Zulu 001. So if you don't acknowledge that, then yeah, we got problems. And, and there was talk of um, OPP antagonizing our people on and off the reserve um, and, and harassing our people. They, they, they don't de-escalate, they escalate. Now the Ontario Provincial Police thinks it's doing things right. Communication, that is... Uh, is the OPP had developed its own framework for policing what it calls Aboriginal critical incidents to address key points from Ipperwash, de-escalate conflicts, be neutral. Don't criminalize Aboriginal land rights disputes. So this is a situation... It's a Another practice. recommendation to understand the history of the land dispute. One of our developers, Theo Nyberg, who owns a piece of land in Desirano, uh, said he was going to develop it. The staff sergeant who's leading it um, say, and one of our developers... The, the terms and references that were used by the police during that briefing were that these Mohawks are trespassing. And then this exchange in an OPP interview with property developer Emil Nyberg. I mean, you're not interested in proceeding with any type of criminal charges in relation to this? No, I mean, I'd rather be able to you get want, back on the property. You want to get on your property and get yeah. it worked in? I mean, uh, yeah. that's the just... The day, that's, what, that's, whatever, yeah. that's what we want as well. Important for us to, to try and to try and assist you and, and to try and know what your immediate plans are with that property. It, again, it's almost like these white people sticking together against the Mohawks, and that's not being objective. That's not a police officer's role. Though Canada accepted the Mohawk claim as legitimate, its policy to never return land sent a different message. Everybody was said that it's business as usual and that we should carry on the way we see fit with the property. So I think the message that that sends to the Mohawks is that um, it's not an important claim. And that sets the police up to basically educate their own officers that these Mohawks are lawbreakers, that they're, 
They don't have a right to be there, and it's just wrong to do it that way. Police can't resolve a land claim, but how does the interest of the Crown impact the law of the land? The OPP looked at an arbitrary federal policy, which was to refuse to take action to return the land, and the OPP interpreted that as being the law. You know, there has to be a meeting point between Indigenous law and Canadian law. The tension between the Mohawk assertion of rights and the OPP focus on public order would play out on the ground in Tyndanaga. It's a, a means of harassment and intimidation and, and it's just something that we're used to. It's April 25th, 2008, three days after the Mohawk blockades ended. Okay, so turn around please. Put your hands behind your back. Prominent Mohawk activist Sean Brandt is arrested after an interview with APTN. Now we have uh, warriors on hand as well and uh, up to, I don't know, 10, 15 uh, police cruisers surrounding us. You're breaking Mohawk law. Brandt had not been on the front lines of the blockades earlier in the week, so there was confusion and anger over his arrest. This is what happens when uh, no, Mohawk please people please stand up and when they, uh, when they assert their, their rights. The charges were minimal. There was no uh, reason, uh, urgency, about arresting Sean Brandt. In fact, it, um, it triggered problems that afternoon, and um, the rest is history. Hostility? Uh, yeah, there was hostility towards the police. They just arrested uh, Sean Brandt for, for absolutely no good reason. The Mohawks gathered at the entrance to the quarry they had occupied for over a year. The OPP blocked off the roads. The tactical rescue team or sniper squad was on standby. You are sending a message to the people involved that you don't respect their right to engage in protest, that you're seeing them as violent criminals. You are making the potential for confrontation that much greater. The OPP's Aboriginal Relations Team was on site trying to de-escalate. The Mohawks knew minor mischief charges were coming for the blockades three days earlier. They expected warrants and planned to turn themselves in like Brandt did before. The Mohawk were told they could return to the quarry, that it was their sanctuary. But an OPP crime team arrived with orders to make arrests. I'll arrest you if you do. I'm on You're under arrest. You're not off of my hands off you. So what you see is a very unexpected, unnecessary, violent takedown. Watch your back, ma'am. It's a situation in which I would conclude as a researcher that there was a double cross, that there was broken faith. And Jolly says bad intelligence. The OPP were convinced the Mohawks had guns in the quarry. You've got to have reliable intelligence on what is happening on the ground. They did not have that. Clearly they did not. Or they wouldn't have responded in that disproportionate fashion. Heads, heads up, guys. Heads up. I see a guy over here. He looks like he's got a gun on the, on the hill. And, and the same word I shouted out from the OPP is, I see a gun. The exact same words as when Dudley got shot. I think it could have been very close that somebody was shot. We've had what we believe is a long gun pointed at us. At Desert I was sitting in the police car. I heard that call. Okay, guys, I see a stick. I see one stick. And I also heard the call that says, I see a stick. I see a stick. It never gets corrected, and then guns are never put down. Can you give us a mark? We think we got a gun here. We need to get some The C8s are still drawn. They're still aimed at our people. It takes one trigger-happy policeman to, to, to pull it. We drove up the end of the road, and I had heard shots had been fired. I had heard that Danny had been hurt at one point. I didn't know what to believe, or he was my little boy. He was my little boy, and I didn't know where he was. Hey, Mom, your dad. Uh, want um, coffee? Yes, please. There. 
Keep it yourself. Keep it yourself. <laughs> a light moment, but Dan Doreen's parents, Alberta and Amzie, will never forget the day he was arrested. I just want to thank my family, um, you know, for supporting me through this whole process. I want the story to be told so that people realize and people know how police treat First Nations people. Um, it, it, uh, my parents, who were, who were naive to think that that could ever happen, and they seen it happen firsthand. The guy had his right by and I kept My mom shows up uh, on the outside of the barricade, not even at the barricade, and she has a CA pointed at her, uh, and, and, and my dad has a gun pointed at him. Uh, a 70 year old man at that time. So I went up the house, up to where mom was staying, and she opened the door, and the first thing she said was, Where's Danny? Where's my Danny? And I had to say to her, I don't know, mom. And that's the first time I ever had to say to her, I don't know where any of my kids are. I didn't know if he was in the hospital, I didn't know if he was in jail, I didn't know if he had gotten beaten up. I didn't know. I just heard all these rumors coming at me. Well, it's, it's, it's like scary and maddening and frustrating and it just pisses me off more and, and um, I think the biggest thing is, is having a gun shoved in my parents' face. Having that rifle at our faces. I have lost all the respect I have for police. I would like to had no more Dudley Georges. That's what I was so scared of that day. I was so positive that day. It's not going to stop me from defending the land. It's not going to stop me from defending our rights. And it's certainly not going to stop me from, from exercising uh, my right as an indigenous sovereign Mohawk person. And I just wait for a phone call. I know, and I know that you just can't say anything on the phone. When, I don't worry. Oh, I know you don't worry. I do it all for you. <laughs> uh, that's true. Uh, Dad can look after himself. We can take back land that's rightfully ours. We can take back our culture. And, and we don't have to ask for nothing. Join us next week for Law of the Land, Part 2. Was there an attempt on the part of some officers to punish them? If so, that's potentially a, a criminal action. A decade-long fight for freedom of information. Our experience is one of delay, bad faith, and obstruction. A mother who fears her son is dead ends up arrested herself. No, it just comes back. And decisions are made. Are we at the end of the road for this? All of the important part of the town is on stolen land. The potential for very serious and for tragic consequences uh, were there. No, it just comes back. <laughs>